um, to talk about new definitions of national security and the future of just war theory. I will introduce both the, excuse me, introduce both speakers and then um, Jessica will speak, followed by Jeremy responding and then open for questions. Um, Jeremy Davis is a visiting assistant professor in the Department of English and Philosophy at the United States Military Academy at West Point, having received his PhD in philosophy from the University of Toronto in 2018. His dissertation defends a modest account of national partiality and explored its implications for the ethics of war. And he is currently working, <coughs> excuse me, on several projects in the ethics of war, bioethics, and the philosophy of death. Jessica Wolfendale is professor of philosophy at Marquette University. Prior to this position, she was associate professor of philosophy at West Virginia University and received her PhD from Monash University. Her research focuses primarily on the ethics and moral psychology of political violence, including the ethics of torture, terrorism, and war. Her most recent book includes, <clears throat> excuse me, War Crimes, Causes, Excuses, and Blame, co-authored with Matthew Talbert. Um, she is <clears throat> currently working on security, the topics of security, torture, terrorism, bioethics, and military ethics, and is looking at the intersection between theoretical arguments for torture and the institutionalization of torture in the real world. Please welcome me in joining Dr. Wolfendam. Okay, well, first of all, I'd like to thank Mark Wilson for inviting me to be here. It's a real honor, and I'm sort of excited to sort of hear your comments and meet you um, after the talk as much as I can. This is a very much a work in progress. So what I'm presenting here is a sort of initial uh, arguments that I'm thinking about in terms of thinking about how states use the concept of national security and what that tells us about the legitimacy and value of just war theory as a moral framework for evaluating states' use of force. So I'll just give you a brief outline of the structure of my talk. So first I'm going to talk a little bit about what I see as the problem in thinking about just war theory in light of national security. Um, then I'm going to talk a little bit about how we ought to understand national security if it is to play the role in legitimising force that it must play in, the, in just war theory in the context of just cause. Third, I'm going to look at how narrative security is actually used by states to justify the expansion of state power into realms well beyond traditional military force. I'm going to use Trump's immigration policies as a case study for this new concept of national security. Then I'm gonna look a little bit about the implications of the gap between the definition of national security that's really required for just war theory and the way in which national security is actually used to draw out some possible implications for the value of just war theory as a framework for evaluating states' use of force. And five, I'm just going to raise some possible alternative approaches to evaluating the ways in which states use the concept of national security and for evaluating a state's use of force more generally. Okay, so here is the problem as I see it. On the one hand, we have a narrative about just war theory that presents a fairly optimistic view about its value. So in the optimistic view, just war theory is valuable because it actually has had a practical impact in restraining states' resort to violence. Um, and backgrounding this, I think, is a conversation about what we want just war theory to do. Right? Is it merely a sort of set of theoretical tools that help us analyze sort of hypothetical justifiability of war? Or is it actually meant to have a sort of practical import in terms of how states think and resort to the use of force? So in the optimistic view, just war theory has this positive practical import. Um, so both has had, and Michael Waltzer, I think, defends the view a little bit like this. It's had a real impact in constraining and restraining states' use of force. And, you know, it therefore follows that it is an appropriate moral framework to use when evaluating the morality of a state's use of violence. 
um, and specifically about the criterion of just cause under this sort of optimistic view. Having a criterion of just cause under the optimistic view um, actually does help restrict the use of wars to wars of national defence. So that's the optimistic view. Here's the pessimistic view, which is, which is a view that I'm more inclined to take, I have to say. The pessimistic view is, is well expressed by Anthony Burke in a 2004 article. So here the claim, and again, this is also tied to what we want just war theory to do. Right? So the claim is not that just war theory is, uh, as, as a theoretical tool, is of no use. The claim is that if we want just war theory to have an actual impact in restraining states' uses of force, then if it's failing to have that restraining impact, that's a problem with the theory, right? If we want, if we want the theory to have that effect. So in the pessimistic view, uh, just war theory, far from restraining states' uses of force, can actually act as what Burke calls a legitimizing framework. It provides a language, it provides a set of justifications that then applied, in a, in, and they're very abstract justifications, so states can sort of use these to justify a sort of wide range of uh, strict forms of strategic violence that really ought to be ruled out, strictly speaking. So what we see, and this is one of the things I think that um, raises some problems with just war theory, is, for example, the concept of a threat to national security, a threat, you know, the need for national defence, has been used to justify the ex expansion of state power well beyond, you know, defence of a state's borders from a military aggressor, which is a fairly narrow definition of just cause, typically. Um, another criticism we might have, or worry might have, is that the just war theory has ceased to be relevant or useful because, in fact, the distinction that between an ethical framework for war, which also incorporates a wide range of special moral permissions, so one of the distinctive features of just war theory is that it's more permissive in terms of the destruction that can be visited on those who are engaged in armed conflict, right? You can expose civilians to a fairly high degree of risk, for example, under a just war framework that would not be permitted under a, a peace framework, say a policing framework, for example. So one of the worries that I'm going to raise in this talk is that this, this neat distinction between the sort of framework of war and the framework of peace is problematized because of the ways in which national security has collapsed the distinction between different arenas of state force. So it just may be that this distinction that just war theory is premised on, that there is this distinction, maybe is increasingly irrelevant in light of how states actually use force. So what I'm gonna suggest at the end of the talk is that just war theory is actually no longer the appropriate framework. It doesn't actually help us to identify the relevant moral issues in the state's use of force. And also I think that it maybe does serve this legitimizing framework that Burke talks about. Okay. So let's move on to the concept of national security. So the first thing I think to recognize is that national security is a relative concept. It's going to be relative to who is being secured, what values are being secured, and from what kinds of threats. So you know, from the get-go, it's actually difficult to come up with a kind of objective definition of national security. So here's one way we might think about it. And again, what I'm doing here is say, well, what would national security have to be if it is going to play the legitimizing role in the resort to force that just war theory requires? Okay. So, and this, what I'm saying here is not particularly controversial, I believe. So it's, you know, we could think, well, first of all, we need to understand what the nation is. So what is it that's being threatened by a perceived threat? Well, one definition of the nation is just that it's a sort of description of, say, a, a government's territorial control of a particular area. Um, so David Lubin, for example, in an early paper, says that one way of, that's one way of defining a nation. But that's not a definition of nation that's going to serve the role of morally justifying resort to force in its defence, right? Unless the nation or national security protects something that's morally legitimate or a moral good, then it can't by itself justify the resort to force. So, you know, and this, again, if you look at the literature and humanitarian intervention, this is consistent with that literature, this recognition that, you know, a state's integrity in and of itself doesn't morally justify the use of force 
in defence. Right? It has to be the case the state is in fact defending or protecting or promoting individual citizens' security in order for national security to have the moral value that it needs if it is going to serve as a justification for defensive force. So for national security to have this role as moral justification for force, it has to protect a moral good. And there are a number of different characterizations of this. One view that I think is I think is more plausible is that ultimately it's going to refer back to the individual security of citizens. Um, and the account of security that I've developed in some other work that I won't talk about in detail here, ultimately is not just that national security is valuable because it might protect citizens' physical safety, although that is part of it, but national security is valuable when it is valuable because it protects citizens' conditions of identity. And the basic idea there is that in order for human beings to live a flourishing life, we don't just need to be safe from you know, physical attacks. We need to have other kinds of conditions that allow us to form and act on identities that are important to us. Um, so admittedly, of course, that idea could use a lot more elaboration, but I'm not going to elaborate on it here. <laughs> but I can in question time. Okay. So, you know, if we define national security in that way as a good that, you know, derives its moral goodness, that therefore justifies use of force, it's going to be in as much as it defends the individual security of citizens. So that means if we think about when a threat to national security would justify the resort to military force, then a number of criteria are going to be required. And again, these are pretty consistent with traditional ways of just war thinking about just cause. So it has to be the case that there is actually an objective threat to the security of citizens. Um, and that word objective is, is actually really quite important. And one of the points I'm going to emphasize in how national security is actually used is that very often um, a perceived threat a threat is created, which is then used to justify the resort to force, but that threat is not actually an objective threat to the security of citizens. So if national security, defensive national security, is to justify the resort to force, it has to be the case that there is an objective threat. And also that force is necessary um, to prevent or mitigate that threat, and it's proportionate and a last resort. So again, here we see the kind of classic just war thinking about when defensive national security justifies the resort to war. Now, it's very narrow. It's only going to justify the resort to war in a very narrow range of cases. And that's part of the, you know, this, the optimistic view, which is that, well, this is intended to then restrict or constrain states' use of force to these kinds of cases. It also presupposes that we can objectively define the concept of a nation. Um, that's also, I think, something that is going to turn out to be a little problematic. So, so that's the kind of ideal concept of national security as it ought to be used, I guess, in just war theory to limit the use of force. So now I'm going to turn to the narratives of national security that I think depart very dramatically from this very narrow conception that I've talked about. So, and this is a worry that has been raised, you know, decades ago. So Arnold Wolfers in a 1956 paper raised concerns that the concept of national security had become essentially meaningless. That it was just a term that statesmen could use to justify pretty much any policy they wanted to justify. So worries about the expansion and lack of precision about the meaning of national security actually have a long history. Right? So in some ways when I talk about new narratives, the narratives I'm talking about may not be that new at all. In fact, they might reflect a long history of the ways in which the concept of national security has been used to justify the expansion of state power. So we've seen references to national security uh, raised as grounds for not just wars of defense, but wars of aggression, regime change, the use of torture and indefinite detention, and the militarization of the border. So again, these practices have sometimes been, well, often been justified on the grounds that they're supposedly necessary to protect some conception of national security, right? Okay. So there's actually, you know, really significant gap between the kinds of uses of military force that ought to be permitted based on the narrow conception of national security I defined earlier and the uses of state force that are actually justified, or claimed to be justified, by reference to protecting national security. Right, so that's the gap I'm interested in exploring. 
Now, one of the results of this sort of expansion of the concept of national security, or it's actually more than one result that it should be troubling us, is that, first of all, there's been a... I can't think of the right word I want to use here. Well, basically, uh, the boundaries between what we might think of as a traditional realm of military force, defence of the state from military aggression, and other arenas in which state power is exercised, such as law enforcement and immigration, those boundaries have become increasingly porous. Right? So we've seen what this has meant rather than... There's two ways this could occur. So it could occur that, you know, as state power, um, the realm of military force sort of is started to infiltrate these other arenas of state power, we might think there are going to be greater constraints on military force that come out of these other areas of, of state power, like law enforcement, which is traditionally a lot more restrictive, right? But actually, the opposite effect tends to occur. Once you have the expansion of sort of military force and the concept of defending the state, into these other areas, you also tend to get an expansion of these special permissions associated with the use of military force. And I think this is, there are two areas in which this has occurred, so domestic law enforcement. So, for example, um, this has occurred in relation to the war on terror, where there's been an expansion of domestic police power, but also domestic law enforcement taking on board not just literally the technology of the military through access to, for example, mine resistant, I'm gonna get MRAPs, I can't remember exactly what all the letters stand for, but MRAPs, which are mine resistant vehicles of some kind, and military technology and tactics and identity. So you actually see this infiltration of sort of militarization into domestic law enforcement. Um, and you also see a resultant sort of expansion in state in police uses of force, and sometimes against civilians as well. The other area in which it has occurred is in immigration. And I'll talk about that in a bit more detail in a moment. Um, so we've seen, again, the, the sort of militarization of the border, which actually also has actually a long history in America. It's not actually that new. Um, and the, also the subsequent spread of military special permissions and, for example, indefinite detention, right, is something we normally associate with, <laughs> with um, prisoners of war and is now being applied to immigrants. Another element of this which I think complicates the picture and particularly complicates the value of just war theory is that in both these arenas and in traditional areas of military force as well, there's now a confluence of private interests and state interests. So the introduction of private actors, both in traditional military operations, private military companies, but also in private prisons and the private immigration detention centres, introduces new motives into the use of state force that were not traditionally there, and that sort of complicates the justifications for the use of state force. Okay. So let's turn to my case study, which is Trump's immigration narrative. Um, so this is meant to be a case study sort of illustrating the ways in which national security as a concept has been used to justify this kind of expansion of state force and this collapse of boundaries between the military realm and other realms of state power. So from before the election, Trump's immigration narrative was characterised by the description of immigration, and I'll caveat immigration from certain areas and of certain kinds of people as a threat to national security. So he said, for example, in a 2016 political advertisement that, you know, we don't have a country if we don't have borders. So, so what he's generating is a narrative of immigration as a threat to the very existence of a nation itself, that without immigration controls, you have no nation, right? You have no country. So that's, that's an, a narrative of, of immigration as an existential threat, right? Um, and I was originally going to compare this with the narrative of terrorism as an existential threat, but due to time constraints, I decided to drop that. But I do think there are interesting parallels with this construction of certain kinds of threats as existential, as playing a very important role in justifying the expansion of state power. Okay, and what's also interesting in Trump's narratives about immigration is he combines narratives about criminality with narratives about terrorism. So he's drawing on pre-existing narratives of terrorism as being an existential threat and one that warrants the use of not just war, but, for example, torture and indefinite detention, 
with this other narrative that, that refugees and asylum seekers are criminals. So that's a kind of domestic law enforcement narrative that he's combined the two. So he actually, he says in an interview in 2015, half of them, them referring to immigrants and asylum seekers are criminals and you certainly have terrorists. So he's sort of combined two different kinds of threats to support the claim that unchecked immigration is a threat to the survival of the nation. What's interesting, though, is that this is as much a narrative as insecurity as it is a narrative of security. And it's a narrative of insecurity because by positing and creating a belief in an existential threat, and I'm just going to assert here, but I can offer more on this later, in the absence of any evidence that such a threat actually exists, any compelling evidence that such a threat exists, what this does is generate feelings of subjective insecurity in American citizens. And that's really probably, arguably, one of the purposes of this narrative. Um, a scared population is a population that is much more likely to accept certain kinds of limitations on freedoms, restrictions on civil liberties, and so forth. Um, so, you know, these narratives that refer to national security use the language of protection, but they actually themselves undermine different kinds of security they, by generating the illusion of an existential threat. So other important elements in Trump's narrative, um, and this derives from the combination of the terrorism narrative with the criminality narrative that I mentioned, is that we have this sort of collapse of a distinction between law enforcement, traditionally thought of as being under a sort of ethics of peace framework with very restrictive, um, with restrictions on the use of force, with a national security or military framework with its greater moral permissions in terms of, for example, exposing civilians to risk and the use of force. So this also, I think, collapses some important categories in our thinking about... Um, the people who are targets of these policies. So if immigrants are criminals and terrorists, then they also can easily be folded into the concept of an enemy. And the concept of an enemy, of course, is also central to just war thinking. Once you apply a war framework, you thereby are positing the existence of an enemy, right? The enemy who poses a threat against whom certain kinds of force may be used. So, so immigrants are sort of folded into this conception of an enemy. Um, and I wonder, and this is somewhat speculative, whether this also undermines the civilian combatant distinction, right? That if the enemy is an immigrant, the immigrant is not someone who wears an, a uniform or is part of a military force, but they are construed as being an enemy in almost the same way that traditional military enemies might be construed. Also, what's driving this narrative, and I think this is also an important point about national security in general. So as I said, the concept of national security that we ought to use if, if it's going to serve the role it's supposed to serve appeals to a sort of objective conception of the nation, right? That all individuals within the nation, their security is a matter of moral concern that warrants protection. But what we actually see in the way national security is used is, at least in this case, a, a racialized conception of the nation. So if we asked who is threatened and who needs to be protected in the narratives that we're seeing, it's not all Americans. It's predominantly white Americans. Right? And we see that because of the construction of the enemy here, or the threat, being framed almost exclusively in terms of people from Latin and South America and the Middle East. Right? So black and brown people of color are construed as being the source of the threat compared to, say, immigrants from Canada or I'm from Australia. Um, nobody ever questioned, ever worried about whether Australian immigrants are a source of criminality, right? Um, so what this means both is that, you know, when we think about the construction of a nation in the language that we use, who is, is, who is excluded is just as important as who is included in constructing the idea of the nation that needs protecting. Right. So the narratives that we see are exclusionary of a certain class, not just of people outside American borders, but also of American citizens. The class, American citizens who are Muslim and Latinx are also effectively excluded from the realm of Americans who are threatened and Americans who need protection. Um, so in a sense, white Americans in these narratives are portrayed as representing all Americans. 
And there are practical imports to this in terms of increased insecurity for, for Latinx and Muslim citizens. Right? Not, I mean, obviously that's the case for people who are refugees and asylum seekers, but the increase in hate crimes, for example, and the greater vulnerability to police and immigration enforcement and policies is a kind of insecurity for some American citizens at the, uh, in order to bolster the, the feelings of security of others. Okay. And, you know, historically, uh, conceptions of the border have often played this role of, of bolstering certain kinds of racialized, normalized images of who matters, whose interest matters. I come from a country where the immigration policy, the official title of the immigration policy was the white Australia policy until the 1970s. So, you know, at least we were very upfront with our blatant <laughs> racism. But that's, in a sense, an example of what I'm talking about. Okay, so what does this mean for just war theory? Well, what I think the case study of the immigration narrative reveals is, again, the sort of vast discrepancy between the concept of national security that, you know, needs to be used if it's going to actually justify the resort to force and be consistent with just war theory and the concept of national security as it's actually used, right, to justify the expansion of, of state power. So what I think it also shows, and this is an insight um, that comes from security theory, actually, is that national security threats are not typically objectively identifiable in a way that we would like to think they are, but rather they're socially and political, politically constructed. So, for example, there are some things that are happening that probably are objectively a threat to the security of citizens, like climate change. That, that's typically not regarded as warranting the same degree of funding and urgency as, for example, the threat supposedly posed by terrorism. So, so what threats are securitized, are viewed as national security threats, also reflects sort of normative assumptions about what's important and who matters. And the other important, I think, insight that we get from looking at the case study is that national security, again, is not a concept that relies on sort of an objective, neutral idea of the nation, but often acts to reinforce and reinscribe um, a normative, often racialized conception of what the nation is and who belongs in that nation. And as a result, national security policies often, or policies justified by reference to national security, often actually don't necessarily protect all citizens equally, but protect some at the expense of increased insecurity of others. So ultimately, national security is not an objective concept. It's not used as an objective concept in the way that it would have to be in order for just war theory to, um, in order to justify the resort to force in the way that just war theory would want. Okay. So, um, so the worry that I see is that the ways in which states have used the concept of national security to justify the use of military force and to justify the expansion of military special permissions into other areas of state power just bears pretty much no relation to the concept of national security that just cause in just war theory requires. So in that sense, I think this creates a problem because it will, how valuable then is just war theory in helping us understand and evaluate how states actually use the concept of national security? Does it give us evaluative tools that help us understand, for example, when national security is used and misused? Um, does it give us special insights into the way in which national security is understood? Um, and I worry that not only does it not do that, but actually it does provide some of this legitimizing narratives that can sustain this expansion of the concept beyond the realm of military, traditional military force. So first of all, you know, just war theory does presuppose, because we're talking about a war framework, an us-them distinction, that there is an enemy against whom we must protect ourselves. And, you know, by so incorporating that concept into, for example, the immigration debate, that enables the, the depiction of asylum seekers and refugees as, as an enemy, right, in a way that brings to mind 
thinking about an enemy in a traditional military context. And I think licenses and makes it easy to tolerate ways of treating these individuals that we wouldn't accept if we were not thinking about them in the framework of a kind of us-them enemy picture. Okay. And the other problem, I think, is because, you know, just war theory is premised in an idea that, you know, the context of war justifies, requires a sort of level of permissive use of force that wouldn't be required in other arenas. By this expansion and by appealing to kind of just war ideas, we do get this expansion of military special permissions well beyond the scope of traditional military force. Um, and I think just war theory also assumes an objectivity in relation to the concept of a nation and the concept of a threat that is pretty much under theorized. So I haven't seen a lot of work from just war theorists really kind of drilling down into, well, what is a nation? What is a threat? What counts as national security? So, so I think some of this problem is perhaps that just war theorists have not been engaging with work in other areas which have been looking at these issues. So what would be an alternative approach? Um, first of all, I think that maybe what we see when we look at the way national security is used in the ways I've described is that maybe it's not helpful in thinking about state force through the context of are we in a war framework or are we in a peace framework? Because I said, if we start with the presumption that we're in a for, uh, war framework, we're kind of already smuggling in a lot of assumptions about the status of the people who we're depicting as a threat and what we can do to them. So, so my suggestion is maybe we want to, my suggestion first is that we ought to maybe re re reject that fundamental distinction. Um, and one of the things I think that's problematic about the distinction as it's traditionally been used is it presumes that we can draw a nice neat line between these are the, so this is the war context and this is the peace context, but the sort of porousness that I've been talking about between these areas of state force really makes it difficult to apply that distinction in a way that's at all plausible. Um, I should say too that one of the purposes I think is being served by narratives of just war theory in the way that they're being used is uh, you know, generally tied to a, what Lisa Hajar calls a hyper-sovereignist view about state power, that states ought to be allowed, ought to be permitted to expand the scope of their force beyond perhaps traditional constraints. So I think there's a connection between the narratives of national security that Trump appeals to and that the Bush administration used in the war on terror um, that are linked to a sort of deeper view about the appropriate limits, if there are any such limits, on state power in general. Okay, so I think we should also maybe reject the presumption that when we're looking at, say, the involvement of the military, we should assume a greater permissiveness in the use of force. Right? I think that's a problematic assumption in light of the ways in which national security is used. So during on Burke, I think it's also, you know, again, reject the prima facie acceptance of the legitimacy of state violence. I think just war theory, and here I agree with Burke on this, you know, does, in some ways almost by its very existence, say, yes, this kind of violence can be justified. This is on the table. So if we reject that assumption, then we might be able to push back against a sort of manipulation of these concepts in ways that support the expansion of state power. So here's a couple of other suggestions, sort of more positive suggestions about what we could do. And again, this is all very preliminary thoughts that I've been developing. So how ought we then evaluate a state's use of force? If we think that perhaps just war theory doesn't provide us with the, the, a useful analytical framework or normative framework that really captures the way and functions of narratives of national security, how should we evaluate them? Well, we could, for example, adopt something like what Rita Floyd calls just securitization theory. Now, what she argues is that what we ought to do is actually, she's coming from security studies, 
And she's arguing that people who work in security studies ought to incorporate some of just war concepts to give a normative analysis of when a security threat legitimately warrants a military response. Um, I, I think there's something interesting in that. So she says, for example, that just securitization would say that the resort to military force is only justified in response to an objective existential threat um, that you know, then meets other criteria like that against which force is necessary in a last revolt and so forth. I'm not necessarily opposed to that, although I have question marks about how existential threat is going to be understood, given the ways in which that concept is so widely misused, and as we've seen. So, uh, you know, my hesitation is that I also think that, yeah, I think there's something important about having a kind of way of analysing and critiquing what a state means by a nation, what a state, how a state is construing a threat, how a state is construing who ought to be protected. But I'm not sure that we need just war theory to perform that kind of analysis. So we can ask, for example, well, is terrorism an existential threat, uh, one that warrants a, you know, what, a 19-year war now in, in, to fight? use of torture back in the day, indefinite attention and so forth. You know, we can ask that question and we can try and answer it, but it doesn't seem that we need to appeal to just war theory to, to ask that question or to sort of answer it. So I'm not quite sure that I agree with Floyd that we need just war theory to do that kind of normative analysis that she's suggesting. Um, I think it's also important to recognise how national security can undermine security, can itself be a security undermining narrative, right? Um, so you could end up with paradoxical cases, perhaps, where a state's national security policies themselves pose a threat to the citizens. Um, so that's certainly, I think, true in many cases, um, and something that I think has been underexplored in just war theory, and maybe which just war theory is not well equipped to actually Analyze, right? So it's another reason why I think I'm not sure that just war theory is going to help us much in critiquing these kinds of cases. Um, Anthony Burke suggests a model of ethical peace. Right? So this is a model which would suggest that when we evaluate a state's use of force, we're asking questions about that prioritise, for example, the human rights of those who are going to be victims of force. So I, I think there's something interesting there. And Burke is not necessarily saying that force would never be justified. So he's not actually defending a, pac a pacifist position in relation to state force. Um, but what he is saying is that, and I think there's something interesting in framing the question this way, is that when we think about a state's proposed security policy, a state's proposed use of force, maybe we should think about it in terms from the people who are going to be most vulnerable to it. How can we justify the use of force to them, right? Um, in a way that you know, protects human rights, minimises uh, damage to individuals, harm to individuals. So again, rather than starting with a framework that permits already a greater degree of destruction, which just war theory does, if we adopt that framework, we're already saying, oh, yes, if we can now do things that we could not do otherwise, we should start with saying, well, will this policy, who will be harmed by this policy... Can we justify the infliction of that harm, you know, recognising the need to protect human rights? And so some people argue, for example, that human rights law actually provides all we need in terms of a framework for analysing when, under what conditions, force might be permissible. So again, this doesn't necessarily commit one to a pacifist position, although obviously it's compatible with a pacifist position. <coughs> Excuse me. But I think it does commit one to fundamentally challenging some of the basic assumptions that underlie our thinking about national security. Okay, so I'll leave it there and turn to my commentator. Thank you. All right, um, so I just want to begin by thanking Jessica for what was really an interesting paper to work through. Um, a lot of these ideas, uh, it seemed to me sort of under theorized in the literature as far as I can tell, so I thought it was a really uh, great opportunity for me to kind of think through these and hopefully for some good discussion. Um, um, what I want to do today is just kind of focus on a few specific things. Um, what I would say is I'm broadly sympathetic to the core concerns um, and some of the issues that uh, were brought up in the talk. Uh, and what I assume were kind of the thoughts that prompted the discussion in the first place. So I'm, 
broadly sympathetic with a lot of the, the sort of main ideas, uh, but I admit that I'm a bit skeptical about some of the conclusions uh, that Jessica wants to draw, so that's kind of where I'm gonna focus my attention uh, in, this, in these comments. Uh, so I wanna do a couple things. First, I wanna suggest that the problem for the just cause condition that Jessica raises is actually quite, quite a bit more pervasive um, than she has suggested, and in fact, I think it's just a problem that's gonna apply across all moral theory. Um, and so for that reason, I'm not so sure that the problem she raises is as much of a problem for just war theory as it might seem. Um, I, and then I want to suggest that even if it is a problem, it shouldn't tell us much of anything uh, about the moral framework for uh, the ethics of war. So let me just start by recapping what I took to be some of the kind of most uh, central or contentious claims uh, in the main points of the talk. Um, first, Jessica argues that the concept of national security has not been defined with sufficient clarity uh, within the just cause condition, or it's used in a way that uh, does not suggest that kind of clarity has been given. Um, as a result of this, uh, national security can be used as a sort of smokescreen for unjust war, morally bad acts, and so forth. She then argues that national security should be understood in terms of individual security, and then that we ought to jettison just war theory, or at least that just war theory has been seriously undermined as the primary moral th framework for thinking about the ethics of war. Okay, so I'm gonna set aside um, the particular def the questions about the particular definition of um, national security. Um, as it happens, I, I had, in my original versions, I had a kind of another section where I was talking kind of, I, I'm a little bit more sympathetic to a non-individual uh, picture of this, but uh, we can talk about that more. I'm sure people have questions about that uh, as well, but I, I wanna focus kind of on a different set of issues. Uh, and actually, I'm not gonna say much about the Trump immigration policy stuff. Uh, I happen to be in a very, uh, uh, strong agreement with that, which also gives me an opportunity to remind you that I'm speaking in my personal capacity and not as a member of the United States government. Um, uh, but anyway, I thought that was very convincing and very, um, I'm very on board with that. So I'm gonna focus on a different kind of subset of issues. So let me begin with the this claim that Jessica raises about the just cause condition. So Jessica points out, uh, rightly I think, that the just cause condition is ripe for abuse uh, in no small part due to the fact that it permits uh, the, the cause permits extraordinary use of force in defense of, among other things, national security. She then discusses how the idea of national security has been and can be uh, easily manipulated to attempt to justify, or in, some, in the minds of some, actually justify uh, certain morally uh, bad actions, uh, and which given its role in the just cause condition, suggests that the condition itself is ripe for misuse, and then more broadly the, the framework in which it plays a central role. So again, I think it's right that this happens. I think it's right that the condition's misused in this way, and I think the Trump uh, immigration policy is really an excellent illustration of that, uh, particularly in, in recent times. Um, but I worry that, uh, if, 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 sorry, if the worry is just that the concept of just cause, or more specifically national security, is likely to be misused, then I think the next natural question is to ask whether this is distinctive or unique to these concepts, uh, either uh, within just war theory or more broadly. And as I said earlier, I think this is a, a problem that's gonna apply across a broad range of moral concepts. So to take another case that kind of came up and is closely related to war, obviously, is the concept of threat. So we'll ask what constitutes a threat. The fact that one state poses a threat to another is obviously very salient in the context of war. It's generally thought to be necessary for uh, defensive harm to be justified. Just like national security, I think the, the idea of a threat can also be used as a smokescreen for all sorts of uh, other kinds of behavior, try to justify other kinds of behavior. Uh, think of the current rhetoric surrounding North Korea, or consider the language used to justify extraordinary restrictions on imports into Iraq during the sanctions of the 1990s, on the grounds that certain goods, for example, things like car tires, sewing thread, glue, refrigerators, could be made to constitute threats to the US. Uh, this idea that some concepts are too vague or can be ripe for misuse, uh, it seems to me to expand far beyond war. So that was an example within war. I think there are other examples more broadly as well. It seems to apply, I think, across a broad range of principles, in fact, to our, some of our uh, bedrock moral principles or other concepts that are central to moral theory. So here's a short list of some concepts that uh, came to mind that I think are also ripe for misuse in the same sort of way. Again, depending on your kind of underlying theory. Um, one is speech, harm, freedom, power, health, certain kinds of relationships, someone being in a family, for example, something being reasonable, and so forth. I'm sure there are plenty of other examples, maybe there are others that come to mind as well. Uh, there are myriad ways these concepts might be manipulated, stretched, or deceptively applied in an attempt to justify what would, justify what would otherwise be seen as clearly immoral behavior. <laughs> 
So I actually agree with Jessica that this is a problem for the concept of national security, but my concern is just that there's nothing all that special about national security in this regard. It's just a problem that pervades all corners of moral theory. Now, Jessica or those sympathetic to this part of the argument might say, okay, that's fine. Um, maybe it even helps to make our point, point more forcefully if we can see that it's a rel relatively common phenomenon that's in, and uh, many other uh, moral concepts are also misused in this way. But I think understanding the pervasiveness of this issue actually serves to shed light on some of the other parts of Jessica's argument, uh, namely in what it should tell us about the underlying theory in which this concept plays a role. So recall that Jessica's uh, claim is that because the manipulated uses of the concept of national security, because of these manipulated uses, we therefore have reason to believe that the theory, theory that asks us to employ this concept, uh, just war theory, is at least seriously undermined or more strongly uh, ought to be jettisoned in favor some, of some alternative framework presumably one that doesn't rely on any of these kind of contested and manipulable concepts. But I think it seems overly hasty to jettison a framework because it might be misused in this way, or as we've seen, in fact, is used, misused in this way. And I'm not even sure it counts all that much against it, such that we could say it's seriously undermined. So I want to resist the kind of strong interpretation that says we should jettison it altogether. And I also want to resist the weaker one that says we should just uh, view it as seriously undermined. Recall those concepts I just mentioned a minute ago, harm, freedom, health, and so forth. Uh, as I said, and I'm sure many others will agree, these concepts are also ripe for misuse. Uh, the fact that it's unclear exactly what counts as a harm, for example, has been taken advantage of uh, by many who wish to assert that such and such a thing counts as a harm and therefore ought to be restricted or uh, banned or whatever. Um, this, in fact, I think is part of what motivates some people, like Joel Feinberg, for example, to look for a more expansive idea of uh, what counts as, if not a harm, then something that kind of falls under a set of restricted uh, acts. Uh, but I'm not particularly compelled to dismiss any framework that employs the concept of a harm as part of that theory solely on the grounds that the concept itself might be misused or misapplied. To be clear, if the concept, is excel if, if it, the concept itself is too vague, as perhaps is the case with something like harm, uh, then this does encourage us, I think, to specify what kinds of har harms are literally relevant. Um, and so this is kind of, again, where this idea maybe of Feinberg uh, making adjustments to Mill's harm principle actually is, is a good example. And the fact that a concept is vague might count somewhat against the particular view that employs it. Um, uh, the, sorry, the fact that the concept is vague uh, might count somewhat uh, against the particular view that employs it when compared with the alternative that's more precise. But the right response, it seems to me, is just to clarify the concept, not to jettison the theory in which it plays a role. And I'm not sure this problem really undermines the theory either, so that was uh, jettisoning the theory, now we're moving to the, the weaker version uh, of just undermining the theory. If the theory is incapable of being specified more clearly, then that fact might undermine it. Um, but again, this really isn't a problem, the problem that Jessica's addressing. Uh, indeed, she aims to specify the concept more clearly, uh, which seems to count in favor of just improving the theory rather than jettisoning it altogether. Uh, the mere fact that a concept can be misused in this way does not seem to count in favor of the conclusion that the framework in which it's employed is seriously undermined, uh, just worthy of some kind of revision. So I've spoken a bit already about why it doesn't seem to follow from these problems uh, that we ought to jettison just war theory. Uh, I now want to consider another positive reason for keeping just war theory that actually I think aligns well with uh, Jessica's overall reasoning. So my thought here is that just war theory offers us a range of tools with which to assess and criticize the misuse that Jessica rightly noted. So for example, when President Trump claims that migrants crossing the southern border constitute a threat to national security, we can argue, employing the just war theory framework, that this doesn't constitute a threat of that sort, and certainly not a threat that would justify any sort of military force of the degree that is being proposed. Um, not by Jessica, but by, by Trump. Um, when a leader invades a country without a just cause, we can insist that one must have a just cause to res resort to war. When they reply that the just cause is just some vague notion of national security, we can dispute that claim. Uh, there must be a legitimate, perhaps even imminent threat to our individual rights. It's worth noting that the same thing is true with respect to our theorizing about what constitutes the nation. Jessica rightly points out that there's a, a moralized con conception here, and a deeply problematic one at that, that's employed to, use, uh, or to discuss who counts as us uh, when we talk about our security. It might be that just war theory is insufficiently precise on this point, and some of us might think that's a problem, uh, but I tend to think that just war theory is right to punt on this question to those who theor uh, theorize about the moral and conceptual nature of the nation. In any case, the problem again is that, is that the idea of a nation, like many other morally loaded concepts, can be manipulated uh, either overtly or co uh, covertly for perhaps nefarious ends. Uh, 
In other words, it's true that the concepts can and will be misused, particularly by those who do not care about morality. And as I've noted, this is just an unfortunate fact about much of moral theory. Uh, but a theory like just war theory offers us the dialectical resources for showing why those efforts to hijack legitimate moral principles will be misguided. They also give us the uh, resources for proposing why certain actions are morally wrong, even if the people in question don't tend to care about that. So to be sure, alternative frameworks do this too, uh, or frameworks like just war theory that are supplemented with other conditions, different interpretations of those ideas, and so forth. Uh, but we need a fully fleshed out theory, uh, an, al an alternative theory, to know uh, whether it'll do better than just war theory on this front. Uh, and until we have something like that, it's hard to assess whether or not there's any framework that would do better than just war theory, and to what degree it might look like just war theory in the end, in which case maybe we're just disagreeing about um, something that really we seem to ultimately agree on. I think, so finally, uh, just one more quick point and then I'll wrap up. Um, I think a lot of the pressure to uh, eschew just war theory that Jessica notes and cites others as tending toward stems from the fact that it's seen, it's seen by uh, many of those familiar with it, not just as a theory used to assess moral actions surrounding war, but also, or perhaps primarily by some, as a kind of quasi-legalistic framework. After all, many Western leaders use concepts like just cause and proportionality in their kind of public addresses or attempts to sort of publicly justify war. Um, and this is true at the global level, for example, in thinking about UN authorization and so forth. So it's also true, as Jessica noted, that uh, some defenders of just war theory, like Michael Walzer, tout its ability to put a limitation on what can be done in war in this kind of quasi-legalistic sense. Now, it might be right that as a legalistic framework, just war theory suffers from extraordinary flimsiness. What counts as national security will be too ripe for political manipulation, and other uh, concepts like proportionality, right intention, and so forth are going to be especially easy to claim uh, that they're satisfied with mal without much of, the way, much of a way to insist otherwise. And so if our target is this sort of interpretation of just, uh, ap sorry, application of just war theory, then I'm closer to agreeing with Jessica that it's too flimsy to be helpful. Simply put, bad actors are not going to be bothered by moral constraints. Uh, and when we ask them to justify what they're doing, they're simply going to manipulate uh, what we take to be the relevant moral concerns uh, in favor of their preferred ends. But again, I think this is going to be true of any moral concept applied in these types of political environments. As far as I can tell, there's nothing distinctive about just war theory on this point, um, uh, even with respect to this particular type of problem. And moreover, for reasons I've already mentioned, I don't think this legalistic picture exhausts the import of just war theory and its kind of moral framework. Indeed, I think that moral theorizing is essential, uh, if not just war theory per se, uh, then certain something, certainly something like it, like a theory of ethics about war uh, that's similar to those that we already see in the existing literature. So let me just close by saying, again, I, I thank Jessica for a really fantastic paper, and I hope it prompted some uh, interesting thoughts, and I look forward to the discussion. So thanks so much. much for those comments. I think you raised some really interesting points. Um, so I just want to kind of have two responses. One is about this concern about whether the worry about national security being insufficiently well defined is, is something that's, you know, uniquely a problem for just war theory. Now you're absolutely right that there are lots of moral concepts that are ripe for abuse in the same way. That are, you know, defined imprecisely, can lead to lots of disagreements about when the concept applies and what it means. Um, I think my concern is that in just war theory, oh, I'm sorry. So I think the, the concern I have is that because of what we want just war theory to do, the worry about this kind of abuse has a particular kind of significance that maybe is less true in other kinds of contested terms, right? So if the goal of just war theory is to actually have a practical import on our ability to evaluate states' falls, then the fact that there are central key terms in this theory that are so imprecisely or shallowly defined is something that really does, I think, undermine its, the, the function for which, is, for which it's supposedly, um, the function it's supposedly serving. So I think that would be one way, I think, of differentiating, but I do take your point that this is a problem that is probably not limited to just war theory. Um, that said, I also think that my, my conclusion is not so much that we need to define national security more precisely, although I do think that, 
It's also that the Just War framework is not just using this concept, but it's importing a bunch of other assumptions which shape the way we think about national security. So, so my worry about adopting the Just War framework when we, you know the, the word national security appears and the word threat to national security appears is that we're already then importing this assumption that, ah, OK, this is going to be a more permissive area of force. Um, there's going to be an enemy. So it's already incorporating other assumptions about what we might be permitted to do that isn't true if we, say, evaluate the concept of national security from a different framework that doesn't have those other assumptions built in. So I think that's an important difference. And so that's why I would also say, yeah, we can use just war theory uh, it does have some analytical tools to help us think about national security, but because of these other built-in assumptions, I think it's problematic. And I think we can get the same kind of questions about what is a threat, what's an existential threat, without necessarily having to import that framework to do that. So we can ask the questions and critique the policies that we need to critique in the ways that Jeremy mentioned, um, but I don't see that we need just war theory to do that. We have existing frameworks, in fact. We have a human rights framework. We have a you know, framework of thinking about... I mean, there's the ethics of peace framework associated, for example, with policing. That could provide some tools. There are analytical frameworks that we already have that probably could do the job in helping us say, well, is this a threat? What is a nation? Um, is force justified? If so, to what extent? So I'll, I'll leave my response there and, and we can open up to comments. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's open for comments over here in the left-hand corner. Thank you for that. Um, just simple question for Jessica. I mean, I wasn't satisfied with the answer though. So what sort of assumptions is just war theory bringing in other than just maybe some other manipulable concepts. Um, yeah, I don't quite see the... Okay. So if you think about the just war... I mean, one of the distinctions between a just war framework and a peace framework in, in terms of how we evaluate violence, right, is that the just war framework is, you know, starts with the assumption that a certain kind of conflict situation warrants a certain kind of moral permissiveness, right? That you can... Now, of course, there are constraints that apply in, in just war also, um, but the amount of destruction you're permitted to inflict on an enemy's forces, on potentially on their environment, their economy, their infrastructure, is much, much higher than would be permitted, say, in the context of thinking about... Um, criminal violence, right? So, and this is a point that other people have made. I'm not saying anything original here. So I guess what I was trying to suggest is that if we say we, we should evaluate national security claims through a just war framework, then we're already adopting a framework that says, ah, if a national security threat exists, then we have these kind of special moral permissions come into play. Um, so that was what I wanted to push back on. I don't know if that helps clarify my meaning. Um, that, whereas if we start from, well, what the questions we want to ask are not whether we are at war and therefore now we're in the realm of these special moral permissions, but, you know, is this use of force going to, uh, for example, violate the human rights of those subjected to it? Uh, is it going to cause more harm than good? So certainly there are concepts from just war theory that obviously are going to be relevant to any kind of evaluation of force, but I don't think you need the framework as a whole to make sense of those concepts and how they might apply. So we can ask, you know, is immigration an existential threat? Is military force warranted as a response to that threat? Um, and we can ask those questions without necessarily assuming that we are in a war framework to begin with. So I, I think that's what I was trying to suggest. Um, I do agree, I think that needs more elaboration. But I, I think my intuitive sense what there are there's a just war theory because it's a package right when you when you incorporate the theory or the framework you're incorporating a bunch of different assumptions that maybe themselves can serve to already legitimize some kinds of expansions of state power right rather than critique them yes here and then in the front yes sir 
Yes. Oh, the microphone. Thank you. I uh, want to appreciate your clarification of how the expansion of war has occurred in this country. I like your example. I think we're starting to recognize that the war on drugs has been a disaster. We're finally starting. And, uh, and I also like that uh, you are trying to offer ways that things could be done, such as you were speaking about, uh, how do we justify this to the most vulnerable? Something there. And, uh, and I'm thinking, as uh, you, you mentioned, you were not supporting a pacifist position. You don't have to. A uh, pacifist originally simply means a person working for peace. And I might note this conference is an ethics of war conference. It's not really an ethics of peace conference, which could be a whole nother two-day conference. I will have a question in a moment, but I think what you're getting at is that there is no security except in creating situations in which people do not wish to harm you. That would be a notion of a peace. So very practically, we have not declared war since 1941. Is there any way we can get Congress to do its duty to sort of identify what war is and put some limits on a presidential power, which I can't imagine in due full respect to the Founding Fathers, I think they would be aghast at what we have this way now. How, how can we become a constitutional power with respect to war? That's a really hard question <laughs> that I'm not well placed to answer. Uh, so I appreciate that. So the idea that there's no security except in creating situations in which people do not wish to harm you. Um, one of the things I would say is that, you know, absolute security is impossible as a goal. So any policy that claims to be in the business of creating absolute security from a threat is already suspect because there is no such thing as absolute security from all possible threats. So what I think we have to think about is, well, how should we conceptualise threats, right? So I do think this is an important point that Jeremy raised, like what does the word threat mean? But also that that's going to be related to assumptions about whose interests matter, right? Who needs to be protected? Um, so, you know, challenging the way the concept of threat is used is very important as well. Um, and one of the things that I've worked on in a different paper... Um, and I like saying that because then it means I don't actually have to give you the argument. I can just say what I said. Um, <laughs> is that, you know, if we think about individual security as incorporating what I've called moral security, so security in one's basic moral standing, right? Security in the sense that one can live in the world with the assumption that one's interests are taken to matter at some basic level, right? Um, then that raises interesting possibilities that there could be situations in which state practices can be construed as security threats in a way that's not traditionally thought of. So, you know, racial sexual discrimination, in my account, could be construed as a threat to moral security. Well, they are a threat to moral security, in my view. Um, so that raises the question about whether we want to think of the duty to the duty to fight discrimination as being part of a state's duty to the security of its citizens. So there's sort of interesting, I think, when you start looking at what is a threat and what is security, that raises new ways of thinking about what a state's duties are. In terms of whether we can get Congress to do anything, I'm really pessimistic, um, but I'm pessimistic partly because, and look, I'm not an American citizen, so uh, I'm sort of here as an outsider, but... Uh, there don't seem to be any positive steps that are occurring that would effectively, you know, achieve the goal that you were hoping to achieve. Uh, in fact, I just, I do think that there are, you know, processes in terms of who has access to democratic participation, uh, who is able to influence decisions that are really problematic and are going to sort of really reinforce the difficulties that we already see in reigning in constitutional power. Uh, and this can be traced back, I mean, again, someone who is a law professor would know more about this than I would, but decisions over the last 20 years that have progressively 
limited the checks on, con on the president's power, right? There's been an erosion of checks and balances, which has led to... And so the idea of a hyper-sovereignist view, which I mentioned earlier, um, I think we're seeing a rise in that, that there's the idea that the state, there should really be no limits. So that was made very explicit in the War on Terror in one of the torture memos where John Yu actually said, essentially, that there should be no limits at all on what the president can do to protect the country from a perceived threat. Right, so that's a sort of driving narrative, I think, that underlies some of these um, narratives that I've mentioned. That's the gentleman in the front here, and then. Thanks, Jessica, I really, really enjoyed the talk. Um, I was struck by what your talk seemed to imply about the, our, our method for the ethics of war, and this might actually be underlying the discussion you had with Jeremy. Um, typically, we think of uh, moral theory as being prior to practice. You can completely abstract from the practical world and develop a theory, and then you apply it. Mm. And one way of reading your concern is there's a problem with the application of the theory. Gets, it, it can be abused and so forth. But it sounded to me like you might be suggesting we really should rethink this, this model of theory being prior to practice. And, and in some sense, practice should be informing the theory and uh, in really interesting ways, because you were really trying to situate our ethical practice in narratives and social, socially constructed practices and so forth. And that seemed to be a, a really innovative way of thinking about this. I think that's an interesting way of uh, framing what I'm trying to do, and I actually agree with that. In, in, and it's not that I object to theory. Right? I'm an analytical philosopher, love my theory. Um, but I do think, in, particularly when we're talking about particular arenas of state power, there are problems when we start from a sort of hypothetical theoretical position and then use that to sort of draw conclusions. Um, and I think that's not just in relation to the ethics of war, but also, for example, in the ethics of punishment. So there are theories of punishment um, there are philosophical theories of punishment about what it should do, but they don't seem to intersect or tell us anything at all about our actual punishment institutions. So maybe, you know, and I think I'd agree with you, is what we want to do in relation to that is look at our punishment institutions and the assumptions, um, normative assumptions, goals those institutions are serving, and use that as a way of thinking about what punishment ought to be. So maybe, um, so I kind of like that idea, and I, I've argued in elsewhere that you know, when we think about torture, we shouldn't start from hypothetical ticking bomb cases. We should start from, well, what is the reality of torture? What does that tell us? What does the reality of torture tell us about the morality of torture? Um, so that is something which I think is really important, and particularly in areas of state violence. Now, that leaves open the possibility, of course, that you know, the theoretical approach is valuable in other areas. I don't disagree. Um, but I do I agree that there needs to be that... We need to, and I think in war we should say, well, what does, you know, what does war do? What do narratives of national security do? And what does that tell us about how should we think about state violence, right? Um, so, yeah, I like that way of framing it. Thank you. Then here and then in the center. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm very sympathetic to your project and, um, you know, have probably made cognate arguments about um, problems with the just war theory, uh, but I'm, I'm I'm puzzled about your bullet point. Of, well, your first thing under alternatives was to reject the uh, distinction between peace and war situations, and. Uh, so I'm, not, I'm puzzled whether you want more precision or less precision. And even behind the question about the, the Congress being unwilling to declare a state of war, uh, or declare war, it seems to me that the, just, the whole just war framework only works at all if uh, war is clearly an exceptional state of some kind. So I'm wondering if it wouldn't, in fact, help in terms of your concerns, if the Congress was willing to say, we are now in an exceptional situation. We've now declared war. Other times, every other time, 
these conditions and uh, don't apply. So it's, I, I agree. I think that Muller point was a little misleading. So I, I wasn't arguing that there is no difference between situations of conflict and situations of peace. Uh, there are differences. The question is whether those differences warrant a, a different moral framework for the evaluation and the permissiveness of the use of force, for example, and the status of the people involved in these different situations. And so that was more what I was sort of questioning rather than whether there be a distinction, because there clearly is a distinction. Um, I guess I don't think, and I think the fact that Congress hasn't declared war is itself telling because there's been the use of a war framework to justify, again, you know, harm to uh, the supposedly unintentional harm to civilians, and I know that's a bit controversial, but, you know, the tolerance of the deaths of thousands of civilians at the very least the use of these tactics that we've seen that I've talked about already. So even though there hasn't been... I don't think an official declaration of war is going to help, really, in looking at whether or not we think those are permissible. Um, so I guess my, my claim is not so much let's be clearer on the distinction between war and peace, although I do think defining war is itself an interesting uh, project, um, but rather, you know, what should be... When we're asking, oh, is this what moral principles should guide our evaluation of the use of force in this context, whether it's a war context or, say, a domestic context, I guess I'm questioning whether we just want to wholesale adopt a new framework. Why can't we say, well, asking whether, you know, in this extraordinary circumstances, for example, should some human rights be derogated? We can even answer that question without reference to just war theory. And, in fact, human rights law itself does, in fact, have flexibility to allow for extraordinary cases. So uh, Professor Mick Reagan is actually doing some work on that. So I think there's, there's, we already have, again, tools in our arsenal, both morally and legally, to allow us to accommodate the concept of these you know, exceptional circumstances um, that doesn't necessarily require this, this assumption that there is a, just a different moral framework that applies. So that's, I think, what I would say. It is what I said. Here and then, I think we have time maybe for one more question. I'll be fast. Um, Ma'am, uh, that's actually open to both of you because uh, you both seem to have, be of the same opinion. I just wanted you all to expound a bit more upon your, uh, your all's uh, President Trump example when you said that President Trump was one trying to constitute like a white nation. Um, when like, I, and that just confused me because it seems that like illegal immigration, also like maybe why y'all kept saying immigration, not illegal immigration. Um, I just thought that was interesting. But like if illegal immigration threatens like every single like person in this, in this country or, or some aspect of each community and each race, why did you decide to focus on trying to make an emphasis on the fact that it negatively affects the white race? I just didn't know if that was... Uh, well, like, one of the... Okay, so um, asylum seekers are not illegal immigrants, for one thing. There is a legal right to seek asylum. So it's, it's misleading to use illegal immigration to characterise all of the cases that we're looking at. Um, the reason why I think that... So, two things. One is an empirical claim about whether immigration, illegal asylum seekers, refugees, threaten the security of citizens. And that's an empirical claim that has actually been evaluated, and there's very little evidence that it does pose a serious threat, right? There's very little evidence that immigrants of any kind commit more crimes than citizens. Um, so there's, that's the empirical claim, right? So given the lack of empirical evidence, what function then does this narrative that we're seeing serve, right? Well, and again, if we think about the immigrants who are being particularly singled out, right, and the way they're described, so it's not just that illegal immigration is posed as being a problem, um, but that these people are bad. They're criminals or they're terrorists or both, right? So... And the class of people who are identified by those labels are, you know, black and brown people, overwhelmingly, by the current policies that we've seen. And again, I should say, you know, the, this militarisation of the border and this sort of association of certain kinds of immigration with terrorism um, began before Trump, right? So this is not something which is unique. But what does that then say to US citizens who are within those groups, who are black or brown, who are Latinx, who are Muslim? So if you have policies that say, you know, Mus Muslims from these seven countries shouldn't be allowed into the US because they're all terrorists, right? That's also sending, it's also saying something to the people in America 
who are from those countries. And it's sort of saying, you are like that, right? You, and, and again, if you look at the empirical evidence in terms of the impact of these policies and also the rise of things like hate crimes, you do see a disproportionate impact on US citizens who are Muslim or Latin American. Right, that is, so there's a concrete way in which these policies that are supposedly appealing to protecting all Americans really actually end up undermining the security of a, a, a group of Americans themselves. So there's a prioritisation of the interests of some Americans, and I should say supposed interests, because again, the claim that the interests of Americans are actually threatened by immigration is itself contested, but the supposed threat is, you know, so these, you know, the interests of these people who are supposedly threatened is used to justify the insecurity of others. So, um, but certainly there's, you know, of course there are disagreements to be had about the extent to which immigration has those effects. But the evidence I've looked at at least doesn't suggest it is anywhere near the kind of threat that it's portrayed as. Put it that way. Did you want to jump in on that? <laughs> well, thank you, Jessica and Jeremy. We're unfortunately out of time. Hopefully this conversation will continue into the break.